violence, crime, and dope. I want all that's bad to be stopped in its tracks. I want all that's good and filled with all that it lacks. I need this world to become quiet and calm. I need all the innocent kept safe from harm. I pray that the day will soon be here. I pray all will be protected, all we hold dear. No more starving, illness or war. Let's step on through, open the door to a fresh beginning, a place of joy, a wish for every girl and every boy. May the earth heal and feel safe once more. May it start afresh and forget all the horror and the gore. Let it begin step by step. Let the change commence. Let's wake up and use our common sense. Mother Earth is in pain and struggles every day. Let's all start to help her heal. Take the hurt away. I wish my dreams would come true. That we can start to save this world, make it good for me and you. Let us learn from all our mess. Share more care and kindness. To show respect for all living things. To be grateful for what all this earth brings. There is beauty under all that is bad. There is joy under all that's sad. We need to find that space, that key. We need to act now. Open our eyes and see. We have but one home, a land for all. For each living thing that flies, walks, and crawls. We have to learn to share, to care. It is time to stop the horror. Come on, do you dare? Fall by Mary Oliver. The black oaks fling their bronze fruit into all the pockets of the earth. Puck, puck. They knock against the thresholds, the roof, the sidewalk, fill the eaves, the bottom line of the old gold song of the almost finished year. What is spring, all that tender green stuff compared to this falling of tiny oak trees? Out of the oak trees, then the clouds gathering thick along the west, then advancing, then crossing over, breaking open. The silence, then the rain dashing its silver seeds against the house. A Time of Bees by Mona Van Dunn. All day my husband pounds on the upstairs porch, screeches and grunts of wood as the wall is opened, keeping the whole house tormented. He is trying to reach the bees. He is after bees. This is the climax, an end to two summers of small operations with sprays and ladders. Last June, on the porch floor, I found them dead. A sprinkle of dusty bugs. And next day, a still worse death, until, like falling in love, be haunted. I swept up bigger and bigger loads of some hatch. I thought sickened and sickening me from what origin? My life centered on bees. All floors were suspect. The search was hopeless. Windows were shut. I never find where anything comes from. But in June, my husband's fierce sallies began. Inspections, cracks located and sealed, insecticides shot outside the bees course. Watched, charted, books on bees read. I tell you, I swept up bodies every day on the porch. Then they'd stop. The problem was solved, then they were there again. As the feelings make themselves known again, as they beseech sleepers who live innocently in will and mind. It's no surprise to those who walk with their tigers that the bees were back. No surprise to me. But they had left themselves so lackluster, their black and gold furs so deathly faded, gray bugs that the broom hunted were like a thousand little stops when some great lurch of heart takes place or a great shift of season, November it came to an end. No bees. And I could watch the floor clean and cool and from windows the cold land. But this spring the thing began again and his curse went upstairs again and his tinkering and reasoning and pride. It is the man who takes hold I lived from bees, but his force went out after bees and found them in the wall where they hid. And now in July, he is tearing out the wall, and each board ripped brings them closer to his hunting hand. It's quiet. Has been quiet for a while. He calls me and I march, 
from a dream of bees to see them, winged and unwinged, such a mess of interrupted life, dumped on newspapers, dirty clots of grubs, sawdust, stuck flyers, all smeared together with old honey, they writhe, some of them, but who cares, they go in the garbage, it is over, everything has been said. But there is more. Wouldn't you think the bees had suffered enough? This evening we go to a party, the breeze dies, late, we are sticky in our old friendships and lightheaded. We tell our funny story about the bees. At two in the morning we come home, and a friend, a scientist, comes with us. In his car, we're going to save the idea of the thing, a hundred bees. If we can find so many unrotted, still warm but harmless and leave the rest, we hope that the neighbors are safe in bed, taking no note of these private catastrophes. He wants an enzyme in the flight wing muscle. Not a bad thing to look into. In the night, we rattle and raise the lid of the garbage can. Flashlights in hand, we open newspapers. And the men reach in a salve of happenings. I can't touch it. I hate the self-examined, who've killed the self. The dead are darker but the others have moved in the ooze towards the next moment. My god. One half-worm gets its wings right before our eyes. Searching fingers sort and lay bare, they need the idea of bees, and yet, under their touch, the craze for life gets stronger in the squirming, whitish kind. The men do it. Making a claim on the future, as love makes a claim on the future, grasping an eye underhand, I feel it start, a terrible, lifelong heave, taking direction, unpleading the men prod, till all that grubby softness wants to give. To. Give. Even dust cannot be ignored by a Jew mukopadiai. With a scentless smell of its own, dust has a lugubrious tenacity to spread and settle in everything. After dusting, brushing, and cleaning, as if coming back from infinity, even when washed with water, yet no dust is gathered in the surroundings. Of our great-grandmother at her old home is seen anywhere today, the 24th May 2020, in our ambiance. No dust can be identified. Yet the dust has a dignified role to play in our life. With its own characteristic tale to bewitch, no dust can be held fixed in a place, as it evaporates, vanishes, or simply evades us. Kyoto, March, by Gary Snyder. A few light flakes of snow fall in the feeble sun. Birds sing in the cold, a warbler by the wall. The plum buds tight and chill soon blue. The moon begins first. Fourth, a faint slice west at nightfall, Jupiter halfway high at the end of night meditation. The dove cry twangs like a bow. At dawn, Mount Hiei dusted white on top in the clear air, folds of all the gullied green hills around the town are sharp. Breath sting. Beneath the roofs of frosty houses, lovers part from tangle warm of gentle bodies under quilt and crack the icy water to the face and wake and feed the children and grandchildren that they love. Once the world was perfect by Joy Harjo. Once the world was perfect and we were happy in that world. Then we took it for granted. Discontent began a small rumble in the earthly mind. Then doubt pushed through with its spiked head. And once doubt ruptured the web, all manner of demon thoughts jumped through. We destroy the world we had been given for inspiration for life. Each stone of jealousy, each stone of fear, greed, envy, and hatred put out the light. No one was without a stone in his or her hand. There we were, right back where we had started. We were bumping into each other in the dark, and now we had no place to live since we didn't know how to live with each other. Then one of the stumbling ones took pity on another and shared a blanket. A spark of kindness made a light. The light made an opening in the darkness. Everyone worked together to make a ladder. A wind clan person climbed out first into the new world, and then the other clans, the children of those clans, their children, and their children all the way through time, to now, into this morning, light to you. 
Reflections Within by Julia Kearns. I look inside myself for ways to express the beauty I see in front of me and know that my words will never be adequate enough to describe the awe. A tall, majestic mountain range, filled with hues of blue, purple, gray, and green, topped with white snow, lies against the bluest sky full of fluffy white clouds. The vision hovers above a sea of aqua glass shimmering in a lake below. The water, so still as a mirror at first, reflects the colors and shapes of the mountains and trees in the distance. The painted forest, green, brown, yellow, and orange, resembles perfection in a painting. The reflection disturbed only by the breeze blown ripples gently flowing ever so slowly across the stillness. Little circle bubbles of air rise to the top as life under the water moves, unknown and unseen, yet there, creating endless ripples of energy. The brightness of the sky shimmers on the smooth water, then fades to dark as clouds roll over the canvas. Water so clean, crisp and clear trickles down the mountainside and lands in the lake ever so gently over the rocks. I see beauty in one single tree growing and rising tall above the place of its beginning, reaching to the sky. I see beauty in its marks, as the roughness, cracks, and peeling bark make it absolutely gorgeous. No other tree ever the same. No two alike. Light brown, dark brown, tan, as all the colors shade together into one. Leaves of green, dark, and light, yellow, orange, and brown. An eagle, proud and strong, flies overhead and soars in ownership of the sky above and the tree below. This one tree alone yet fulfilled in its purpose to provide a home. My smallness felt so strongly as never before. The large brown home of the eagle, made from leftovers created so carefully. Praise for the renewal of one of the most majestic creatures on the planet. Black, brown, white tail and still, ever so still. The soaring eagle above the tree and, lo, the tree has purpose. I breathe. I inhale deeply the fresh air. I listen intently and hear the sounds. I look and see with not only my eyes, but my heart, the glory and awe of the sight before me, and my soul is filled with peaceful energy. In this moment, at this place, living is worthwhile. If the tree's only purpose is to provide a home for the eagle, and my life's only purpose was to experience this sight, it would be enough. Stifled by Vicky Aqua There are secrets to be uncovered in the rainforest, something mushrooming from a medicine tree, what goes on in the woods and jungles. While we hustle, bustle, pacing the pavement like ants, never to become one with mighty trees, the buzzsaw and blades working to create another beautiful mall, I am stifled, can't breathe. These earthly home wreckers are earth disturbers. My environment is clinging, holding on for dear life. Rats share space with me. Viruses fill the air on subways, yet right here on this small planet. I once could tap tonic from trees, but now earth is choking. She's crying, I cannot breathe. So many secrets to be uncovered in the rainforest. Something mushrooming from a medicine tree could cure us, yet I am forbidden to reveal. I am afraid. I may never get to feel the cleansing of a forest breeze. I chant to feel that which has left my womb and disappeared may summon the spirit of unknown secrets to come. Enter my energy field. Take me to the place where I may see streams of pure water. Hear the calling of ancient voices and play in red clay, molding clay pots and weaving fabrics on my loom. There are secrets that could mend us. With knowledge of leaves, roots, red dirt, and water, we can know of all things that lie in the thick, streaming lakes. Instead of cesspools, we'd have tonic water and mushroom juice. We never had a chance on these cemented grounds, pacing back and forth like ants, killing habitats and creating havoc. Can you plant a small tree in Manhattan for me? For her, for them, they put us here and now they leave. 
Wealthy folks head for the hills and mountains, bathe in natural fountains. Now it's them that are draped in gold and amber, put a damper on our habitat, plundered all the earth, replaced grass with turf, while my bare feet know not the grass nor soil. Stench and debris arise from pavements and boiling heat, blocking the charge that would release this negative energy from my feet. The Pond by Gregory Orr Snapping turtles in the pond eat bass, sunfish, and frogs. They do us no harm when we swim. But early this spring, two Canadian geese lingered. They built a nest. What I'd heard of our neighbor feared, goslings. As they paddle about, grabbed from below by a snapper, pulled down to drown. So he stuck. Hunks of fat on huge wired lettered hooks. Attached to plastic milk bottle buoys. The first week he got three turtles. And still there are more. Sometimes he finds the bottles dragged ashore. The wire wrapped several times around a pine trunk. And the steel hook wrenched straight as a pin. The Tree Agreement by Elise Passion. The neighbor calls the Siberian elm a weed tree, demands we hack it down, says the leaves overwhelm his property, the square backyard. He's collar and tie. A weed tree? Branches, green buildings, subway tracks, his patch of yard. We disagree. Claim back the sap, heartwood, wild bark. He declares the tree hazardous. We shelter under leaf hoard crossway for squirrels, Branch houses for sparrows, jays. The balcony soaks up the shade. Chatter song drowns out cars below. Sun branches down, leaves overwhelm. The tree will stay. We tell him no. Root deep through pavement, elm. Too Big to Fail by Mel Brake. You were essential to all those creatures who relied on you. You provided a stable home in the cold months and a warm refuge during the rainy season. Many looked over you, but you never looked down on them. Many thought that you would always be there. You saw many dwellers come and go over the years, both humans and animals and other things. But you stood tall in silence, like the majestic spirit that you were. Not exactly a redwood, but a gentle giant to me. Those you would salute with a morning hello, and those who would send you a small thank you during a heat wave and prayed that you survived another major storm. But that last derecho broke every bone in your body, and when you fell from your lofty heights, you still save our cars and homes and us from bodily harm. We are the ones that will miss you. And when the mechanical tree removers will see you as profit or the owners of the apartment building a damn inconvenience, we are the ones that will miss you. When there is a gaping hole in the ground, and your physical presence will be chopped up for furniture to be sold at Macy's. We are the ones that will feel you, spirit. And when a strong wind blows again, we will know that you are essentially free. Water Devil by Jamal May. Spout of a leaf, listen out for the screams of your relentless audience, the applause of a waterfall in the distance, a hurricane looting a Miami shopping mall, how careful you are with the rain-cradling curve of your back. Near your forest, all are ready to swim and happy to drown in me, this lake of fire that motes the edges. From my mouth, they come to peel the flames and drink their slick throats into the most silent of ashes. And they will say this beast is invincible. They will let glaciers drip and trash be muddled with the supernatural blue until we cannot tell the reek of landfill and the intoxicating scent of seaweed apart. They will try to rip this universal language of unity from our throats until we are left stranded, high and dry, soothing our children with old legends of whales as a tsunami of natural disasters rages on outside. They will make us survive. The very force that brought us together. The very body that washed away our care and our creed. Every color in water is blissful. They will not admit 
They are intimidated by our collective passion. They will simply let creatures be overfished until sea turtles and bluefin tuna are more fairy tale than non-fiction. Until our children do not know sea foam, only bubble bath. They will let this enchanted forest, open to all, be overrun with more plastic than ivy, until this force that has saved us, forced us to love each other blindly, is more of a force to be saved from. But we will always fight. And no, we may never restore what, what once was the liquid aurora lights, but we will never let the savior be anything less than at least a blink of light against this cruel world overwrought with reasons to turn on one another. Even at its demise, the sullen black blue is what mends our wounds and washes the hurt away with its salty laps at our ankles. Even on its deathbed, this gentle planetary is giving us a reason to keep living. It's whispering gently in the tides. Survive this. A dashing current come to save us from our own wreckage. One last time. A Sunset by Ari Benias. I watch a woman take a photo of a flowering tree with her phone. A future where no one will look at it. Perpetual trembling which wasn't and isn't. I've taken photos of a sunset. In person, wow, beautiful. But the picture can only be as interesting as a word repeated until emptied. I think I believe this. Sunset, the word holds more than a photo could, since it announces the sun then puts it away. We went to the poppy preserve, where the poppies were few but generous clumps of them grew right outside the fence, like a slightly cruel lesson. I watched your face, just out of reach. The flowers are diminished by the lens. The woman tries and tries to make it right, bending her knees, tilting back. I take a photo of a sunset with flash. I think I have something. To learn from anything, learn nothing from the street light that shines obnoxiously into my bedroom. This is my photo of a tree in bloom, a thought unfolding across somebody's face.